Okay, welcome. Welcome back to our second session of the first day of the Irish Writers' Weekend London. My name is John Forster. I am lucky enough to run the events programme at the British Library. And a few months ago, as we thought, it's time, time we got to know our friends in Ireland that bit better. We had the idea, let's create an Irish Writers' Weekend. And it's an absolute thrill that we're finally at this, at this moment in time. Um, we're having a wonderful collaboration with the Coach International Fe Festival of Literature in Galway. So thank you um, for their, to their amazing team, Manuela, Ashleen, and former director, Sasha, um, for all the amazing ideas, contacts, collaborations that, that has been such a joy uh, as we put this event together. I also want to thank Culture Ireland for their generous support, the Embassy of Ireland in London, and our wonderful hotel partners, the Doyle Collection. So the next session I'm particularly excited about is the art of the essay. And one of our speakers, um, Sinead Gleeson, said, why don't you do a session about the essay? It's an amazing art form that's really flourishing at the moment. And once we started identifying potential writers, there was absolutely no shortage. So I'm very excited about this one. Um, I'm now going to introduce you to the stage our panel. With them will be Chair Brian Dillon, who is Professor of Creative Writing at Queen Mary's University of London. His recent books, most recent books, uh, include, I suppose, a sentence, Essayism, obviously an expert on the essay, and The Great Explosion, and has a new book coming out in February called Affinities, so do look out for that. So please welcome our panel. I don't know where anyone sits. <laughs> Good afternoon, um, and uh, thank you, John, for that uh, introduction. I'm going to... No, I can't. It's too heavy. <laughs> there we are. I'm going to do that um, so that I can see you all slightly better. Um, thanks so much, John, for the, uh, for the introduction. Thank you all uh, for being here. Um, and also welcome uh, to those people who are joining us uh, online. Um, we're going to speak... We're going to have uh, a few readings um, and then a chat between the five of us, um, and then we'll hand things over to you for the, the last uh, 15 or maybe even 20 minutes or so. Um, and please be aware, um, I will remind you this, uh, of this before we leave the room uh, at the end, book signing will be happening uh, over in the main library building uh, straight after this event, just as after uh, everything else that's happening uh, this weekend. So we're here to talk, as John says, about uh, the essay. Um, I've got very used, and I'm sure that other people have, to having conversations in which we talk about a certain kind of renaissance, uh, rediscovery, sudden excitement about the essay uh, in Ireland. Maybe this is true, and maybe this is one of the things that we'll, uh, we'll come to uh, in due course. Maybe we want to think that the essay has always been with us, um, and we might go back through a lineage going back to Edmund Burke, Oscar Wilde, Elizabeth Bowen, Maeve Brennan. Um, we might want to think about the kind of literary ecosystem that makes essays possible um, uh, in Ireland and among Irish writers uh, worldwide at the moment, including publications like the Dublin Review, Gorse, Banshee, Winter Papers, Tolka, and, uh, and many others. Um, we're talking about this form, the essay, in a context where it is true that there has been, um, uh, if not a resurgence, a certain kind of visibility um, of Irish non-fiction writers. And some of the people who are not here um, on stage today might include writers like... Um, Emma DeBeery, Mark O'Connell, Carl Whitney, Megan Nolan, Rob Doyle, Claire Louise Bennett. In other words, including writers of fiction, writers in, in other forms for whom the essay um, is one of the things that they do. That's true of everybody on stage uh, today, but I think we have a group of people here that, that are really well placed to think hard um, and to give you some insight into their practice of the essay as a form. So I'm going to introduce people more or less as they go, as they read from their work. I think we've kind of agreed to read for uh, less than five minutes, so it's sort of three to five minutes. I've sprung this on people at the last minute, so we've, we've hastily cobbled together copies of, people, copies of people's books. I'm amazed that anybody turns up to a festival not carrying a well-thumbed copy of their own book that they want to read uh, from and harangue you about uh, at length. Um, I think we're going to begin, Patrick, with you. Okay, yeah. yeah. 
So Patrick um, is uh, an essayist, obviously, but also a short story writer, a journalist, most prominently uh, for the Irish Times, where he's a feature writer uh, and columnist. His essays have appeared in the Dublin Review. You will find that the Dublin Review will get name-checked many times in the next uh, 55 minutes or so. Um, and I hope that everybody will rush out and buy Show Your Work, a recent anthology uh, from the pages of the, D the Dublin Review. Um, and Patrick's first essay collection is OK, Let's Do Your Stupid Idea, which was published two years ago. Patrick. So all you need to know about this essay, I've gone for a particularly ridiculous extract although uh, there are serious things in here as well, uh, is that uh, the essay starts, or this extract starts with me in a plane about to jump out and do a parachute jump with a bunch of people who've just trained how to do a parachute jump. Let me tell you how to jump from a small plane. First, you reach out of the plane above the tremendous void of air that falls for thousands of feet beneath you, and you grab with your right hand the beam that runs diagonally from the base of the plane to the wing. When you step on the step below the door, your right hand still grasping the beam, and grab another bit of the beam with your other hand. Then, despite millions of years of evolution, during which we did not grow wings, you step off the aforementioned step and hang by the arms from the beam, your legs flapping in the air, very, very high above your mortal enemy, the ground. <laughs> then Steve, Steve is the instructor, counts to three, and if you're Carl, who's another guy who was in the plane, you do not let go, and you continue to hang there with a panicked expression on your face. Let go, said Steve. I've changed my mind. He didn't do that because he'd have fallen. I've changed my mind, says Carl. No, that's wrong. I'm getting the tone wrong. Let me try again. It was more like, I've changed my mind, screamed Carl screamingly from his screaming face. <laughs> you can't change your mind, said Steve. I want to go back in, screamed Carl, hanging from the wing of a plane 5,000 feet above the ground. <laughs> I can't let you back in, said Steve. It's too dangerous. Ah, said Carl. <laughs> Sorry, Carl, I can't let you back in, said Steve firmly, as though talking to a toddler. A toddler who he was forcing to jump from a plane. <laughs> ah, said Carl. Here's something important I learned from my time with Carl. There is only so much time you can spend hanging for dear life to the wing of a plane before you lose strength and have to let go. In Carl's case, it was around two minutes. Then he lost his grip and plunged to what to him must have seemed like imminent death, but was really just a sensation of imminent death that humans flirt with because we have no natural predators and have evolved into something ridiculous. So. <laughs> Thanks so much, Patrick. <laughs> Sinead, would you be happy to, to go next? Um, Sinead's going to read from her essay collection, uh, Constellations, published in 2019, uh, which won the Nonfiction Award at uh, the Irish Book Awards. Sinead writes essays um, for publications like Granta, Gorse, Winter Papers, um, and many others, and has uh, edited three, I think, at the last count, short story collections, um, including uh, The Art of the Glimpse and The Long Gaze Back. Um, and her most recent book, edited um, with Kim Gordon, uh, is this woman's work, Essays on Music. But you're going to read from Constellations. I am. Uh, and, and because we're in London, and, uh, in, and I think coming up to Christmas makes me think of people who aren't here anymore. Uh, in 1992, I spent a summer living in London because I thought I couldn't wait to get out of Dublin. And the same year, um, my grandmother also died. And I wrote about her in the book. And I, I guess... Maybe being here is making me think about herself. So decided to read a little bit of The Haunted, Haunting Women. I see women coming over the hills, walking down to the towns and cities, pulling coats with missing buttons tighter, balancing babies on worn hips, saving pennies and counting cents, not shaking off the boss's hand when it lingers too long, the multiple jobs or work turned down, rounding the corner with a buggy only to find a flight of steps, crisscrossing the supermarket aisles with stop, stop, stop asking me, wiping noses and undrunk cold cups of tea, pristine kitchens, lives without a minute to spare, fury simmering in their heads. I see one woman in particular, all the moments of her life piled up like bones, the countless actions, the days of her youth, she recounts to us a drip feed of her past. And in the midst of all those addresses and moods and cigarettes, all those sighs and each way horse bets, she's embodied by two things, weeds and ghosts. It was spring and in the back garden, my grandmother pulled up dandelions from the lawn. 
There were never any flowers in this garden, save for this unwelcome yellow, tearing up roots, pulling piss the beds from the soil. My grandfather records that she walked back into the house, leaving the sunshine over the coal shed and just collapsed. They'd shared a bed for 50 years and he knew her breathing, each rise and fall of it, but he'd never heard her breathe like this and not her pneumatic snore. My mother arrived and her brain flooded with panic, dialed 888 over and over, wondering why she couldn't get through. At the hospital, a doctor declared it a catastrophic heart attack. That morning, she'd smoked half a cigarette, extinguishing it with her bare fingers for later. As the paramedics worked on her, the upright, blackened butt looked down from the mantelpiece. She always told ghost stories, not the ones about spooks and banshees or bogeymen who'd get you in the dark, the ghosts she knew. You should be more afraid of the living than the dead, she said, in any situation, whether it called for supernatural advice or not. I knew she meant her father, but she took her time telling us the story. My mother still tells it, and my aunts do too. Thanks very much, Sinead. Um, next up is Emily Pine. Emily is a professor of modern drama at University College Dublin. Um, her essay collection, Notes to Self, was published in 2018. Uh, won the Book of the Year at the Irish Book Awards and won the uh, Butler Literary Award. And her first novel, Ruth and Pen, uh, was published earlier this year. Emily. Thank you. I'm poised between reading two different pieces. It's really hard, isn't it? This is one of the features of the essay, is that they're varied. And I was going to read an intense piece about my dad being in a hospital bed, only I spoke to him this morning and he said, will I ever get out of that hospital bed, Emily? <laughs> and so I think I'm going to read a slightly more light-hearted piece because it's a Saturday. I mean, it's not quite morning, but you know what I mean. Okay. Growing up, I had no bicycle. Coincidentally, I had no friends either. And just as I pretended I was fine hanging out by myself, I pretended I didn't care that I couldn't ride a bike. Then I got too old to start learning, too big for the baby bikes, and so that was it. I didn't learn. While other kids used their bikes to go out into the world, I stayed home reading. If I had to go somewhere, I walked. I told anyone who would listen that I didn't mind because I loved walking. I convinced even myself. Then, in my 30s, when I moved by myself to another country, I thought I might revisit the whole bike thing. After all, if I failed while abroad, it wouldn't matter because no one would know. So I went to the local cycle shop and in a tiny voice asked if I could rent an adult bicycle with stabilizers. <laughs> as soon as I said it, I wondered if such a thing even existed, but the bearded man behind the counter just nodded and asked me if I wanted to sign up for their adult learners course starting the following month. I blinked. I found it hard to imagine that there were any other adults who did not know how to ride a bicycle, let alone enough to run a course. Even so, I didn't want to wait. I asked again about renting a learner bike, but the guy should, shook his head at stabilizers. Then he offered to give me one with the pedals taken off. I said I thought bicycles needed pedals to work. <laughs> you learn to balance first, he said, then graduate to pedaling. So I took the pedalless bike he gave me, found an empty car park with a slope, and started pushing myself along, first taking one foot off the ground, then, scarily, both. I did that for the whole morning, going round and round the car park. Once I got good at that, I pushed the bike a bit further up the slope. I turned, and then I halted, hands on the brakes, feet welded to the ground. It looked less like a slope now, more like quite a steep hill. <laughs> Maybe I'd done enough for one day. Maybe I didn't really need to learn at all. But I knew the real failure would be to not even try. So I let go and I glided. For the first time ever, I glided and I felt the air whoosh past me and the ground move under me. At the bottom of the hill, I skidded to a halt, terror giving way to amazement, amazement to pride. Then I pushed the bike back up to the top and let go again. All I did for the next two days was push myself and that bike to the top of the same small hill, letting go over and over. I was happy. I taught myself to ride a bike. I practically taught myself to fly. I recall that feeling of gliding and flying and whooshing all the time. And I wonder, what was I so frightened of? And then I think, why can't I just do that? Let go more often. 
Thanks so much, Emily. And uh, Jessica's going to go next. Um, Jessica Trainer is a poet, essayist, librettist, um, author of uh, poetry collections Liffey Swim, The Quick, and most recently uh, Pit Lullabies. She has an essay in the current Dublin Review, is that right? Um, uh, winter Big Papers. Mm -hmm. this <laughs> oh, where's Reset? Oh, that was the Dublin Review, yes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, she's going to read from uh, a recent essay in Tolkien. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a little extract from this essay, which is called Arcana, which is about my um, kind of fascination with and slight scepticism around things like the tarot and small town psychics. The Hermit. One day when I'm in my second year of college, my mum calls me. I'm sitting in my boyfriend's flat reading as I lay dying while he smokes spliff after spliff and plays Grand Theft Auto Vice City. We're going to see a psychic, she tells me. Are we? Yes, he's in Mullingar. I've booked us in tomorrow afternoon. We drive to Mullingar. I'm feeling a bit resentful and impatient with the whole trip, but any small distraction from my vast unhappiness is welcome. We park the car and make our way to a dingy pub in the town centre. It's early and there's no one there, not even the owl lads you might expect to see propping up the bar. We sit down and finally a barman arrives. He seems much less surprised to see us than we are to be there. He makes us some tea in tiny chrome pots which leak most of their contents on the sticky tables when poured. He tells us the psychic is on the way, or rather he says, Oh Billy, yeah, he'll be running a bit late with the calving, hang tight. After a while we get the nod. I go first. I sit at the table in a back room and a slight man in early middle age comes in. He wears mud-stained work trousers and a fleece. He's slightly stooped. How are you, he says, taking a pack of cards out of his pocket. I watch him shuffle them. They're yellowed playing cards, not a tarot deck, and he worries and flips them with great speed. He stops and looks at me sharply for a second, then back to the activity of flipping the cards. His movement is like that of a card sharp, constant, dizzying, as if in trying to draw the eye away from some sleight of hand. But he talks all the while, responding ostensibly to the things he is seeing in the cards. He doesn't tell me my future, not as such, but he tells me everything I know about myself and it is quite remarkable. He tells me I am burning the candle at both ends. He tells me I am with the wrong person. He tells me I am stuck and that I know it and that I know only I can help myself. The only predictions he makes are also linked to the things I already know about myself. Privacy matters to me, so I will live somewhere where I can withdraw from the outside world when I need to. Intimacy is important to me, but also autonomy. And though my current relationship is doomed, I have already met the person who will offer me the stability I need. But he seems less interested in these things. He seems more concerned, gently but insistently, about the mess I'm in now. You can't go on the way you're going, he says, not looking at me. But sure you know that. I do, I think. I do know that. I come away feeling like I've just had a counselling session. I've come away thinking that what we know about ourselves and each other at a glance is not really because some of us possess psychic abilities, but because our small, tired problems are all the same. <laughs> Thank you all for that. Um, I have lots of questions about all four of those, but um, we'll come to some specifics in a minute. Can I fire a quotation at you about the essay? Something that I've always found kind of uh, consoling and at the same time terrifying. And it comes from Elizabeth Hardwick writing in uh, 1986. And she says, it is an occasion for happiness since it, it is always astonishing that anyone will write an essay. To wake up in the morning under a command to activate the stones of an idea, the clods of research, the uncertainty of memory, is the punishment of the vocation. And all to be done without the aid of end rhyme and off rhyme and buried assonance, without an imagined character, putting on a hat and going into the street. <laughs> and I just wonder whether it's possible to describe what the happiness or the punishment is like for you. In other words, 
to what does the process of making an essay feel like. Um, I suppose that one of Hardwick's points is any idiot can have an idea, right? What's the next step? Um, and I wonder, maybe Patrick, if you would. Yeah, so like my book is literally called, okay, let's do your stupid idea. <laughs> so I genuinely think any idiot can have an idea. But I also kind of think any idiot can write an essay. Um, like, I think the other thing that isn't mentioned in Hardwick, like I, my day job is as a journalist with the Irish Times and everything is so specific in newspapers. We were talking, me and Brian were talking about it before. Like if you're writing an opinion column, it usually starts with a very fixed idea. And the reason I've never been an opinion columnist is I don't really have very fixed ideas. And one of the things I love about essays as a form is that you can literally start with an instinct or an intuition and you write your way into the form. And so like, I do get joy from them. I haven't been as prolific with them recently, um, but I do get joy from them. But often the joy is like, and I don't know, everyone might have very different views, but when I was writing my book, I realized in retrospect, I kind of had a rule of thumb that every essay in it had to be either entertaining or helpful. Um, and if it didn't fit either of those th things, I, wa I wasn't comfortable with it. So I had essays I didn't feel comfortable with putting in the book. Um, and when you do something helpful or you think is entertaining, you get joy from that. And when you transfer a bunch of experience into something that you can transfer to someone else and give them something useful, uh, and I know not everyone agrees that essays should be useful, but I, I'm a very utilitarian person. <laughs> so. Great, thanks. Um, anybody else? I think, I don't know if it would be joy necessarily for me, and I think a lot of essayists also get asked about uh, catharsis, about did, did, did getting this off your chest, did writing this down make you feel better? Uh, for, for me, the answer is, is no, um, and I do, and I like you know I like the Louise Gluck line that at the end of my suffering there was a door, and I think some people feel that with the essay they they go out the other side of it and they feel something. Um, I've never had that. What I what I do like about them is, as same with Patrick, I often don't have a very straightforward idea of where I'm going, and I and I write my way in, have a look around, literally in a kind of little burrow and, and see what's there. But what I do like about them is that I, I find the answer to a question. And I, you, you'll hear that very hackneyed thing about, oh, essay, you know, essay to try, it's from the French, and all of that. But it, for me, it's always, how do I feel about a subject? How, well, and that can be, you know, sport or a, a, a grandparent who, who saw ghosts or whoever it is. If for me, it's about digging in and how do I feel about the subject? What's the answer to a question? And often, with, for me, essays start with a question. And, mm -hmm. and I, that, that kind of curiosity is a kind of its own sort of joy in a way, being curious about how it's going to go when you do start digging into it. I think I want to come back to curiosity uh, in a while. Emily? I think that I, that I love the line about the door because then the, uh, the thing that you finally go through the door and, oh, there's more suffering. <laughs> 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 so the, for me, it is, and, and this is sort of a, you know, if we're talking about titles, notes to self, I kind of wrote them for myself in a strange way out of an intense need to have, to have some kind of witnessing of my own experience. And that is autobiographical, that's not just the essay, that's autobiographical writing, which is one of the things I always say, is like, you don't have to be mad enough to publish your own life writing to find value in writing it, right? To, to, so there are two stages to it. There's the private writing, where you really get to do what you want on the page. And Jan Carson was talking about this earlier in terms of writing in an uncensored way for your first draft. And then there's making it public, like bringing it out into the world and editing it and trying to make it take on some kind of beautiful shape where it can be entertaining or helpful to someone outside of your own brain, which is a crazy pl place sometimes. So I think for me, it's helpful to think about those two stages because they are, they, the, the form works differently in the stages and it serves different purposes. And so whereas privately it can be very cathartic, I think it's quite dangerous to make the work you put out into the world mm. as a form of cathar like serve a cathartic purpose. Um, I suppose I'm really interested in coming from a poetic background and looking at the process of how I would put a poem together and, and the luxury and the space that the essay form gives me in comparison because I find that my starting points are often very similar. It's around looking like looking at a memory or a time in my life or an incident or an anecdote that is obsessing me for some reason or another that's preoccupying me. And then, much like you were saying, Sinead, coming into it not really knowing where I'm going to end up 
and, and following the kind of lateral drift of those ideas and juxtaposing them together um, in, with a lot more space than I would be able to in a poem. Um, and I kind of find, for me, it's when I'm writing an essay, I'm less interested in kind of creating poetry or, or lyricism on the line level, but I am interested in using those poetic uh, juxtaposition techniques and, and placing things beside each other and seeing how they speak to each other. Um, and I definitely find a kind of a joy in that when it, when it works and a, a lot of the opposite when it doesn't. <laughs> um, I very much like the idea that an, an essay, or maybe also a collection, because I want to ask you all about collections as well, I think, um, is somehow just the act of putting one thing beside <laughs> another thing and see, seeing what happens. Um, Emily raised, I thought it would take us a while to get to this, um, but I'm going to ask it now. And I suppose it's a question to do with um, the personal. Um, and it seems that in all of your cases, possibly even in mine, um, it's not just personal experience that we've all written about, but it's something more intimate. And it's either very precisely physical, in terms of physical experience of whether it's of illness or childbirth, um, but also writing about mental illness, writing about depression, writing about anxiety, which more than one of us has, has done. And I suppose I have a, a slightly different version of the same question, um, which is when you're writing about that level of experience, what's the kind of process of transformation? So em Emily's talking about it in terms of like two stages. And you almost kind of cast one of those as sort of indulgent, and then the other almost as if then you have a kind of responsibility to, to put a form on it. Put a, uh, put a only if on indulgent it, is a really good word, Brian. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm definitely using it in quotation marks. Um, but I, I wonder what that process is like um, when, it, when you're writing about something so, so specific. I teach some students um, uh, on a, a course writing about illness writing about physical illness, writing about mental illness. So there's always a kind of moment after a month or so where I have to say to them, great, you've all got these fantastic ideas about your own experience, about family experiences, and, and so on. And then I have to say, who cares? <laughs> and, and why should we care? Why should the rest of us care? And I just wonder if it's possible to kind of describe how you get from that focus on the physical or, men or, or mental or emotional experience, the specificity of that to something that then matters on the page and matters in the larger mm. context. I think it's also to do with the fact that this is where the distinction between memoir and essay comes in. Mm -hmm. um, the great Vivian Gornick, who writes brilliantly herself and brilliantly about the form of the essay, says that the, the memoirist tells all and the essayist selects. And I think that's the kind of mm. difference. Um, I also feel that I, I, if I had just written a book about my own life, I wouldn't have been interested in either writing that or publishing that. Mm. Um, for me, it, I think a really good essay looks inwards and outwards. I think Rebecca Saul that calls it, you know, writing as a citizen and writing in the dark, um, where you're looking both at, you're connecting it to art and science and the world and the medical world and, you know, politics and religion, and, you know, sexuality, whatever it is, but you're also uh, threading your own experience through it. I, I, that's the kind of work I tend to gravitate towards. It's the kind of work I hoped to make myself. And I, it would have been, I, it's already difficult enough as and Emily and, and I did a lot of panels together with their books where you know you don't want to be completely rooted in your own pain it's very difficult and exposing to do that so that if you if you do have these sort of like tenets that you can you can project your work onto that, that are looking outwards at the world it doesn't feel as exposing if you do have those very dark moments if you're writing about your, your dad in hospital or whatever or me in hospital if you're writing about other aspects of it or, or, or digging into why those things might happen how the medical world is patriarchal how religion is patriarchal how you might link the two up with you know hospitals and churches so I think there's if, as long as it keeps looking outwards I think you can definitely guard your, and kind of gird yourself a little bit about mm -hmm. from that kind of exposition uh, and feeling that kind of vulnerability that it because it is hard to put this stuff on the page as we all know. There's also, I think part of the distinction is just that some drafts you're, you're thinking about what happened and you're putting it on the page. As soon as you start thinking of a reader, which any writer should do, I think maybe that's wrong. Like I always I think do. everything I say, there's an exception, <laughs> like Sinead. <laughs> but like, I think once you start thinking of the reader and who the reader might be, or even just one person, it becomes a different thing. So like I wrote, um, in my book, I have an essay called Brain Fever that's about my own various tr trials and tribulations with mental health. And I wrote a version of that about three years before I wrote the version that's in the book. And that was, I looked at it afterwards and it was just raw and pointless and painful. And 
it didn't really like it has all the same material in it but it, I just kept, like in what I was saying earlier I just felt it would be of no use to anybody to read this mm -hmm. and when I wrote it later like I totally I didn't even use that draft I just started again um, I was kind of thinking more of a reader and what you transmit to the reader and in that sense I think there is something cathartic in just for me like I know there's that for you but just in explaining yourself mm -hmm. but not explain like so you're explaining it to someone else which actually makes it easier to explain it to yourself mm. um so that that's my take on it yeah. Yeah, and i think as well you know the more you write into a subject the more you realize that nobody's experiences take place in a, in a vacuum or in isolation you know and it kind of becomes like the rings of a tree or the circles of hell whichever way you want to <laughs> visualize it but you know that there are there are links between your individual experience out into the world and those are the interesting routes that present themselves for you to follow i think as you as you go through the process i think though as well that question of like putting where putting <laughs> private details out into the world, right, and trying to transform it into, a, into something that other people will read is really difficult. Like, it's not an, it, it, it leads to a lot of soul gazing. And I would come, I would write in this tiny little room that was meant to be a children's room in my house. And I, one of the things I write about is not being able to have children. And so it's not lost on me the irony that it's now my writing room. And the, and, and I don't, and I don't even call it the, you know, it's just, it's the, now the laundry room and I happen to write in it as well. And, but I would come downstairs and I would say to my partner who is also a writer and I would say, no one is going to want to read this. Like, no one wants to read this. And he would say, in the best, nicest, tough way, <laughs> he would say, go back upstairs. Do not think about that question. Write it and write it to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. And the extraordinary response to Notes to Self and so, I mean, I work in a university, and so my email address is publicly available. And so I, ha I have had contact from hundreds of people who have contacted me about parents with alcoholism, um, infertility, um, drug use, sexual violence, the, all the cheery things that I put in my book. And I realized that, oh, these are the things that connect us, the mm -hmm. things that we... And I say this, I say this about, um, about the work all the time to get it out in the open. It's about making vulnerability public in a kind of political way and saying the things that we hide are, and work so hard to hide so much of the time are actually the things that we share. Mm. It's, t it's testimony too, right? So there's yeah. a kind of thing, like there's a similar thing in my book, like there's a mixture of things like I just read earlier, which are purely about getting like, gags in there. And then I've written about the, the things that people have responded to most, and I, get, and I still get emails about, or there's an essay about me not having kids. There's an essay about care work, because I was a care worker for a while, and there's the essay about mental health. And those are the ones, the ones that are kind of most exposing are the ones that people still email me about, mm -hmm. you know? And there is a weird, like I didn't really realize that was gonna happen. No, I have no were, idea, yeah. yeah. And if I had, and I wonder if it's the same for yeah. other people, if I had had an idea, I might not have had the nerve to do it. That's, that's what I mean about never thinking about the reader. It's just because it's too terrifying to think about the reader that I would stop yeah. myself. And I think also in writing this kind of nonfiction and this kind of personal essay, um, censorship of yourself is fatal. And I think when I, the, when I read work and I know that somebody's gone right to the edge and they've stepped back and they haven't gone there, it's really easy to spot on the page. And I think the reader spots that in mm. authenticity. Mm -hmm. And it's always a disappointment as a reader when you see it. So if I thought about the reader, I'd be holding back all over the place. So that's why I pretend that no one's ever going to read it. Mm -hmm. And that, that gets me over the line then. Mm. But I wonder how that relates to what you said earlier about the politics of yeah. it. And in, in my long list of questions, politics question mark comes towards the end, but we're already yeah. there, so that, yeah. let's we're stay We're very there. advanced. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I totally understand what, what, what you're saying about uh, a sense that, um, a sense of authenticity, but there's also, is there also a sense of a kind of responsibility in terms of the kind of wider political context of an essay, impact of, a, of an essay. I wonder how these things kind of sit alongside each other. Because it seems to me that it's really obvious that a lot of the work that you're doing and that some other writers uh, in Ireland and Irish writers elsewhere are, are doing can sometimes feel in its putting of, of that personal experience into the world, can feel automatically political. 
Does, does that make sense? It, it, um, but I, I wonder how that then kind of affects you as you write. Maybe, maybe it doesn't at all, as you say, Sinead. No, I, I think it can. And I think, again, we, you and I were asked this question a lot, and we did a lot of, we did a lot of festivals over here, and there was a lot of, what's the resurgence, and what's the resurgence in the female voices? And I think both of us said, you know, there was a, Ireland has changed more in the last 60 years than it has in the last 10 years, uh, you know, socially, politically, culturally. And I think a lot of the, and it's funny, I was talking about Maeve Brennan recently and about, you know, a lot of those quiet short stories and those very, you know, claustrophobic rooms where everything was kept behind closed doors. So I think a lot of this, as, as, as you and I have both said, is was this breaking down of silence has happened and a lot of voices, a lot of essayistic voices, a lot of female voices came out of that because, again, people didn't talk about these things. They didn't talk about sexuality and reproduction. And again, the idea of the political, you'll remember around the time of marriage equality and repeal, a lot of people yeah. had a huge impact on campaigns because they told personal stories, often at great expense. Um, and you know, wrote essays, wrote pieces about what it was, just what, what had happened to them in the hope that it would you know, affect legislative change, and it did. So I think there is a kind of, kind of umbilical link between the personal and the political side. Sometimes in the, in the Irish essay, it's hard not to make it political when we're, we've, we've gone through so much flux and change. And I think definitely lots of things about the essay now are about saying the unsayable, where we came from a country where there's a lot of oppression where you couldn't say anything. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Mm. Everything was told through fiction. So yeah. the unsayable before was told by people like John McGarren yeah. and Edna O'Brien, but through fiction. Mm. And I think there's, it's no coincidence that your books, I think, yeah. not that you were thinking of it consciously, but there's no coincidence that your books came out around the same time as the marriage equality campaign mm. and the repeal the Eighth Amendment campaign, because there was, a no, there was a change, there was a switch in the country when people started talking about things that were never talked about before, and it became a more open country. And also I think people were hungry for, I don't think that the type of responses we were talking about before would have happened if there were short stories. And I think part of it was, oh, this person really had this, and I really have this, I want to send them an email. Um, so there is, like, there's a political thing. On the other hand, I think any time I was tempted in this book, and I did write every now and again versions of the essays that had more self-consciously political stuff in it, where I became Jesus on the Mount. It was mm -hmm. fucking awful. <laughs> and, and I removed it on, on reflection because I don't think I don't think anything in any of our books would have worked so well if we were very consciously trying to write something mm -hmm. political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do think it is just still a very political act being a woman mm. in the world today even in privileged western europe and um, and you know what you're saying is and the, 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 the this outpouring of voices was really important but it's not a straight line and there are still things that get pushed back i mean i think we've all talked about the things that people have responded well to but there are other things that you write about and even you know at draft stage where people will say i mean i think particularly around the area of things like gender based violence there's still a lot of discomfort and do you really want to say this out loud and and people people advise caution with that, which always comes from a good place, but, but still strikes me as something that's a little bit um, kind of retrograde and surprising, I think. Mm. Um, I was thinking about, um, I mentioned like a sort of like handful of, of essayists, Irish essayists going back centuries earlier. Um, and you could imagine a kind of lineage that would go back at least to the 18th century, right? Mm. In terms of like, you know, Burke and Barclay and people. Um, when I first, I'm not sure that I ever thought to myself, I am an essayist, this is my ambition. But I do remember maybe 25 years ago thinking, as a writer, I know I don't want to be an academic, so what, what's the alternative? And sort of fleetingly thinking, God, if only you could write essays <laughs> and sometimes I try and remember what what did I or reconstruct what did I mean by that and for me I think it was definitely a way of not being an Irish writer in an important sense because it felt to me as if there weren't models for that and I wonder how you have felt whether or not any of you um, thought of yourselves when you started writing as essayist or had that as a term yeah. kind of even on the horizon. Because I think it's, it's, it's one of the peculiarities of the essay is that many of the greatest essayists never describe themselves as such. Mm -hmm. They think of themselves as novelists or autobiographers or critics or whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. journalists and so on. Um, 
And I just wonder whether for you, historically, in terms of your own writing careers, there have been those kind of figures where it made sense to you to think of yourself as a non-fiction writer or as an essayist. Because mm. I certainly felt, when I, when I started, a, a real lack of, of those models. Yeah. What do you reckon? So I would say that a lack of, of, of a model and an explicit model, because in the dark room is in theory essays, but not, wasn't, sorry, I'm pointing at you and talking <laughs> about your work, um, but it wasn't packaged or sold as that, which it might be now. Do you know that sense? Mm. So it was about as well, I kind of, I remember when, when I said to, because I am an academic, um, <laughs> the thing that Brian didn't want to be. Um, the, <laughs> I'm a sort of academic. <laughs> I know, we, we corrupted you in the it end. Um, but I said to my friends, you know, oh, I'm, I'm doing... Because I kind of wrote notes to self quite secretly because I didn't really know what I was doing. And I would say to... But I didn't think I told you about it for a long time. Well, you told um, me about it when it was finished. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise! Um, but I said it to a couple of friends, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm writing a non-academic book. And they went, oh, brilliant! And they said, is it a novel? And I said, no, it's essays. And I went, oh. <laughs> and there was that sense of, like, oh, we did that in school. Um, and or in college and, and now we're, we're done and and I weirdly in hindsight it was very freeing not having Irish models right because I didn't quite have to define what I was doing if I had models and I did and I just happened to be my favorite genre is American women nonfiction writers mm. Mm -hmm. They're just extraordinary. I mean, you've named Vivian Gornick, mm -hmm. um, you know, Joan Didion is an obvious example, but Megan Dorm, Ariel Levy's work, mm -hmm. you know, just amazing, incredibly strong voices. And I, and I remember me reading Megan Dorm, and I had, you know, had a bit of a crisis of confidence, and I was reading her essay about the death of her mother, and she's, and I won't go into it, but she's so matricide, so mm -hmm. and it's just brilliant, and she's, she starts off by describing how her mother's apartment lease was due and her mother's dying in the apartment, but they didn't have enough money to pay the next month's rent, so they just start packing up the apartment around her as she dies. And this is just the most horrifying thing. And I thought, well, I can do that. Like, if someone else has done that. So that sense of a different voice. But it was really important to me that it was American, like that it was from outside of, uh, of the small world that I think we think of as Irish letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is definitely, I think if you're thinking about writing within an Irish tradition in that way, then I think the notion of politics would be writ large in a way that I think most of us prefer to approach in a much more sidelong manner. And I too would have looked to, you know, writers like Maggie Nelson or Eula Biss, who I've really enjoyed recently, for that kind of freedom of form, especially as well, and coming from a kind of a poetic background. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and admiring writers like Anne Carson, where there is no rule book. You know, that, that, that was a kind of an interesting segue or point of access to me. And I didn't necessarily see that in, in the Irish scene. Um, but then, you know, having really enjoyed over a long period of time, um, you know, Maeve Brennan and The Long-Winded Lady and, and things like that, and that kind of skill of observation. And yet that still feels as being quite outside of the Irish mm -hmm. milieu as well. Yeah. I was definitely influenced by Ye. Like in the and and a lot of other a lot of female writers because the, uh, like a lot of the models for this book would have been without that would have been kind of humor writers like David Sedaris or mm -hmm. Clive James and people who influenced me when I was younger yeah. and then when I read your books and then I was reading like Deborah Levy and a lot of mm -hmm. Ameri American and British writers I kind of realized oh you can kind of go deeper and I've always liked things that are kind of managed to go from funny. To quite serious and dark and then back to funny and then serious and dark and I think having those two roots was really important to me and the fact that there was an opening in the world of essays yeah. like suddenly there was like suddenly you didn't you, you could do it and not just be a humorist which would have been the only avenue I'd have seen for myself before yeah. You know. I, I just remembered that I had written a, a tiny little piece about January 5th which is the day I got a leukemia diagnosis and I had been driving behind two a hearse with two coffins in it. I wrote this very short piece and a, a really big publisher got in touch and said, do you want to write a book and can you write a few bits by Patrick's Day? And I did, and they were looking for a memoir, I think, and I went back and they were, yeah, great, this is great, it's great. We just want, we want more death, we want more grief, more kind of sad stuff. Uh, do you want to do that? And, and I just went, no, I don't. Uh, so I kind of said no. And then 
I started to kind of find yeah, people like, I think, I think Mark O'Connell said to me, read Leslie Jemison mm -hmm. and Maggie Nelson and Eula Biss and Roxanne Gay and people, and it was all the Americans, and there was a lot of essays, kind of the golden age of the, the American essay, who were all writing, you know, writing in fragments, writing in kind of like really deconstructing what you can do with 10 pages, which is essentially what an essay can be. That wasn't linear, that wasn't chronological, that wasn't a whole life. Um, and that was it for me. It was it was definitely the Americans, I, and of course, re reading Maeve, who wasn't called an essay at the time, yeah. she was a yeah, columnist. Yeah, and actually, like her, they, they really are. Those long-winded yeah. lady columns, like you kind of look at them now, and they're thousand-word essays that yeah. are so hard to define. Mm. They're, they're also just about the quotidian. I mean, there's, a, there's an essay about broccoli. You know, there's an essay about just looking out the windows of, of what you call the home fires of New York, mm. the small restaurants. And just they're about very, it. very minute and small things. And I, I think people often think the essay has to be about something landmark, you know, a, a bereavement or a change of country or a terrible relationship. It can be about something very small. Mm. And that's, that's yeah. what yeah. Brennan does so well. Yeah, but, but there are also some of the greatest essays about New York yeah. mid-20th mid mm -hmm. yeah. century. When, I think maybe 20 years ago, when, when um, it must have been when The Visitors was republished, mm -hmm. around 2002, um, and a friend of mine said, you have to read this, but you also have to read this weird book of her New Yorker columns. Yeah. And he said, it's like reading Walter Benjamin, <laughs> yeah. but Irish. Yeah. <laughs> and in New York, not Paris. Yeah. And that's, that is also what she is. It's like one mm -hmm. of the great kind of city uh, Essayist. Yeah, she's a, she's a flanouse as well. So yeah. like a lot of the, like, the kind of yeah. psychogeography, the sort yeah. of, yeah. you know, the Benjamin talk, stuff is I could is talk about on. those for the rest of it. Like, the, <laughs> they're amazing. Like, nothing happens in them, but yeah. they're so well observed. Like, it's often, I went for a walk, they're it was raining. They're very sad as well. They're very yeah. melancholic yeah. as well. She's very lonely. Yeah. Mm. She's all on her own and all of them. We're really selling them. They're sad, they're lonely. Yeah. But, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> but I think that brings up, sorry. I just want to move to these people shortly. We've never stopped. Should we do that now? Yeah. Um, Dave Brennan fan there club are, as, as far as I know, there are a couple of microphones uh, roaming or roving, whatever it is that microphones do in these situations. So we have a question down the front and another one here. Do we have mics? There's a mic on the way. And do we absolutely require the mic? For, we probably do because yeah, we're we do. Uh, filming. So this, exactly. So there's a microphone coming down to you uh, right now. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, I have a question, but first I used to get the Dublin Review on a regular basis, uh, though my other reference for essays was Zadie Smith. Mm. I live quite close to her. Uh, the question is, what's the difference between an essay and a short story? In olden days, I am old, I used to think that essays were there to put across a point. So we're often written somewhere like a spectator or somewhere like that to push a point of view with a few personal touches. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, uh, as a lecturer teaching essays, is the difference between an essay and a short story? Because I always thought the Dublin Review was short stories. I'm definitely not going to try and answer that question. I'm going to hand over <laughs> to my <laughs> Well, is it, is it just, is it, is it fiction and yeah. non-fiction? Is, mm -hmm. yeah. is, that, is that too simple? <laughs> and yet, and yet the, the, the boundaries are kind of Gaps, blurred. It, they're getting more blurred as yeah. well now, yeah. I think. I mean, you've got all this, you know, Auto fiction. Maggie Nelson mm. writes what she calls auto theory. Um, there's a lot more blurring. There's a lot more hybridity now, and I don't think anything is just one thing anymore. Mm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think the, th the thing for me, and you had said this, Patrick, which is like the the to write an essay and to publish it and call it an essay is to make a claim for its non-fiction status, mm. and that to me has a lot to do with its value, right, and its impact. Yeah. And it, but, it, but it also has something to do with some of its costs. So I, had, I was working with a student who was writing a collection of essays and finding it incredibly difficult to describe the things that she felt she needed to describe. And so we had some conversations, and she turned it into a collection of short stories. And strangely, fiction enabled her to tell the emotional truth that she mm. needed to tell that she couldn't because she couldn't publish it as nonfiction because of what it would do to her family. So there's also thinking about, I think, what, what each genre can, like, mm. can offer to writers and to readers. There's also the, the, the I try and write short stories as well. And one of the things I realized very early on is that certain things, because I'm a journalist as well and I do a lot of long-ish form re reportage, is sometimes when you transfer something into a fictional medium that had been an essay or had been a bit of reporting, 
it doesn't work anymore because the thing that making the claim that it's an essay does is it says this is true. And some things that people say are in real life are too good to be true almost. <laughs> and when you put them into fiction, people go, that's completely implausible. Like there's stuff I've had people say to me when I've been out interviewing people on the street about things. And if you put it into the voice of a fictional character, people would go, that didn't happen. Mm. So there's a, I think the claims to truth are really important in the essay. Mm -hmm. There's a question up here. So, um, yeah, it's you. Exactly the same <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> there's someone just... Is there there just beside the, the microphone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there's a gentleman over here. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm a journalist, and I've noticed a kind of strange trend, especially with younger people, that um, they're often encouraged to capitalise on their pain or their trauma in order to gain a foothold or to write an interesting think piece. So if someone has a mental illness or a disability or has experienced something traumatic because of their sexuality, there's the tendency to turn that into a sort of think piece. Do you think that's the same in the essay writing world? I think me and Emily have talked a lot about this before and we feel very strongly, uh, I think some editors are very exploitative of young writers and shouldn't be doing that. There's a, anything I put into my book, and uh, people kind of different views on this, was processed emotionally. It was, when I said earlier that the early draft of the book, the piece about mental health was raw and painful, I think if I was a young woman in my 20s, an editor would have made me publish that, and it might have flown away online, but it would not have been good for anyone to have that out there. Mm. So I think any, I would think any of us have thought very long and hard about the things we put in, like we selected what we put in and we'd processed what we put in mm. to our pieces, and I don't think the trend you've identified is good or healthy, and I would, recommend to young writers that they don't. Apart from anything else, Ronan always says, you're wasting it in your 20s. <laughs> Write about it in your 30s or your 40s <laughs> when you're a better writer and it will like be a better bit of mm -hmm. work and you've processed it. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. And I'm sure you get the same. We get sent copies of books in proof, you know, and I quite often get sent memoirs from young women and I got one I mean, it's a while ago now, but it came with a cover letter saying, you've never read trauma like this before. And I just wondered who is minding that person who wrote that book. Mm. Because like, it's just, you know, it, it is, it's really exploitative on an individual level. I worry about readers as well, mm. you know? And then, and I say that as a, as a, partly as kind of a teacher with a strong sense of pastoral care. Mm. Um, but also I worry about like, what, what that does to the genre as well, you know, where it becomes, starts to become identified, not with broccoli, but, you know, with, yeah. with trauma. Yeah. And what does it do on a cultural level as well? I think sometimes these kind of um, very heightened responses to horrific incidents like that, you get this great public outpouring of outrage and then nothing actually happens mm -hmm. and it almost becomes a corrective to any action. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really dangerous dynamic um, and I, I've certainly had editors in the past when I'm writing in the area of mental health kind of asking me almost to be a little bit crazier, you know, <laughs> like could you, could you be a little bit crazier, you know, could you be a little bit, you know, and you're kind of going, well, no, no that's, that's not the point. The point is around writing about the mental health issues that many of us live with on a daily basis, not about proving that I'm the winner in the terrible low stakes game of mental health collapse, you know? So, yeah, it's, yep. There was another question here. Um, there's a microphone coming behind you. Hi, um, I just wanted to pick up on the socio-political aspect of the, uh, the short, uh, the, 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 the essay that was mentioned earlier on, and in particular, something Patrick and Sinead alluded to, which was the notion of the unsayable. And I just wondered if the panel had anything to say about the, the unsayable as a kind of um, facet or feature of the, 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 the contemporary Irish essay. Mm. It's, it feels to me that there's, you can say anything you want now. Um, it's whether you want to or not. And any time I teach workshops on the essay, um, there's often people who are, if I publish this, I live in a small town, no one will speak to me. If I publish this, my mother will never speak to me. If I, if I tell this 
story, this secret, whatever it is, um, I'll be cut off from the family, all of these things. So there is a price to be paid. And again, all, all of this, as Patrick has said, uh, have weighed this up very, uh, at great length, because I think you can write, I think writing for some people can be cathartic, can help figure out an awful lot of things. You don't have to publish it. Mm -hmm. And I often say to people as well, like, oh, I'm just gonna, somebody said to me once, I'm gonna just publish it in this tiny little journal. And I'm like, well, people take pictures of pieces of writing and they post them on Instagram and Twitter. So it, just because you think it's no one's going to see it, it's still a piece of published work. So you, you have to make that. There's, there's certain things. I mean, there's, there's, there's pieces in Constellations that I've, you know, I, I've never, I wouldn't read at, at, at a festival or on a stage like this because it would be too difficult to do so. So you have to weigh up what, whether you want a piece out in the world. And I think that unsayableness can be just for yourself. And sometimes it really can mm. work for people to get it down and to kind of to, to, to grapple with it, to sort of figure out what they say. I always figure out what I feel about things when I put it on the page. Mm don't necessarily have to publish all those things. And I think that's maybe, previous to the last question, not often said to a lot of young writers, you don't have to, mm. you don't have to perform your pain on the page for other people, but only you can kind of make that decision, I think. I think sociopolitically, a lot of what happens is by writing about things that were unsayable, like I think you both did in your books oh. in different ways, it makes it sayable for other people. So like, I, I mean, my book doesn't go as far in anything really, but like about things like looking after disabled relatives or um, I, I was a care worker so it wasn't relatives I was working with or, or or the children issue which is really touchy for lots of people. A lot of people contact and go I, w I was really nice to see someone put words in that. So there is a kind of interesting thing. I think in Irish culture there has been a thing about the unsayable becoming sayable over the last 15 years. Um, and I think essays have been part of that process. Sometimes people just need to hear some of the things that are, yeah. that are said. And I think that both of you writing about children, that was a really big one for a lot mm. of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, because the thing is, the unsayable is not just, I think, about kind of so, social taboos or social norms or social agreement, but also how it makes you feel as an individual coming up against those taboos, which is isolated and lonely and like you're losing your mind and like no one else is like you. And then, as I was saying earlier, you, you, you realize that other people are carrying things or have these, these vulnerabilities in common with it's you. There's a community, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a community of, um, and, and, and the vulnerability hangover is something that we haven't kind of mentioned, but it is, it is there and it is strong. And even when, when, it, when it's processed and you write about it. So I think there is, there is a cost to saying the unsayable um, and it's, <laughs> It's not a coincidence that the book I wrote after Notes to Self was a novel written in the third person, because I really needed not to be writing nonfiction in the first person mm -hmm. for a little while. You know, you just, you gotta, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sinead, it's exactly the same. Novel's coming out soon. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're gonna have to stop. Um, so um, I'm sorry for the unsayable questions that will now be unhearable. <laughs> um, but thank you all so much for that. Um, before, before we applaud our, our four writers, remember we're all repairing straight away to the main library building uh, to sign books. So we're, hopefully we'll see some of you there. Thanks very much. For coming. Thank you. Very much.